Welcome back. You're listening to the panel discussion, a secure multi-cloud approach in government, sponsored by Equinix Government Solutions on Federal News Network. I'm your host, Jason Miller. My guests today are Doug Casa, the Deputy Chief Information Officer at the Defense Intelligence Agency, Greg Smithberger, the Director of Capabilities and Chief Information Officer at the National Security Agency, and David Peed, the Vice President and General Manager of Equinix Government Solutions. Now, before break, we were talking about the hybrid cloud, security around it. And, and I want to start with Greg, because one of the comments you made earlier in, in our discussion is the cloud is a tool. It, it's a way to get to where you want to be. And, and when the NSA and the IC developed their gov cloud initially, it was not, hey, we have a cloud, yay. It was, oh, what can we do with it? And what you have been and continue to do with it is really apply these emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning analytics. So give me a sense of how this all comes together and how you guys are starting to use the AI and, and ML capabilities. So the original concept behind the, the IC Gov Cloud was that we wanted to break down the individual stovepipes of data within NSA. We had different repositor repositories for different types of data. And uh, our humans were spending too much of their time retrieving data from individual repositories and then trying to glue it together. So the idea was, can we bring all uh, most of the data, if not all the data together and allow the machines to kind of crawl over all the data and serve up to the humans uh, what they're authorized to see. And can we make the humans more effective and efficient in getting to the parts of that data that are most relevant to answer the questions that we're being asked to answer. So uh, from the very beginning, uh, pieces of this uh, environment were, uh, were developed that were optimized for running big data analytics uh, uh, across very diverse sets of data at large scale and uh, automating the things that the humans did routinely. So there was a lot of automation and there are uh, both uh, sort of routine tasks that run in the background as well as human uh, driven uh, sort of queries uh, that take place. And that's where, sort of where we started the journey. And then as we looked at uh, how do we take the next step and how do we in particular deal with the diversity of languages that NSA has to deal with in this uh, large volume of data, we really started leveraging machine learning and AI to help us to interact with uh, uh, information in a variety of different languages as if it were you know, English text. Uh, that was where we sort of started the conversation. We sort of blossomed out from there. And then uh, also looking for, uh, in addition to sort of signature-based ways of identifying things of interest, uh, how do we do more behavioral things? Uh, more heuristic things. So uh, a lot of the machine learning and AI have come to, uh, come to bear there. But a lot of this is taking the drudgery off the humans. So if there's something the humans are going to do all day, every day, let's just pre-compute the answer and have it sitting there for them. Uh, or if there are things that we can do to uh, prior help the humans to prioritize what they look at first, let's get the machines to assist it as much as they can, you know, with, informed by what the humans are doing, but get the machines to help them out. That's really what we're trying to do with all of this. And this move to this multi-cloud, hybrid cloud approach, plus the really evolution of these tools. I mean, you guys are probably doing much more today than you did three years ago, than you did five years ago, right. than you did 10 years ago. So I think that the difference is we started off sort of within our own government owned environment. And clearly, you know, uh, in many cases when we started uh, this, there weren't really the same commercial offerings. So we had to invent things. Right. Uh, over the, the years, we've paid a lot of attention to what industry is inventing, uh, what's coming out of academia. We're incorporating that in and doing hybrids of uh, NSA invented and uh, externally invented things. I think the key thing for um, the commercial cloud services is that they're bringing in, they're allowing us to bring in uh, these more mature commercial solutions uh, in those uh, spaces and make them broadly available to the entire t intelligence community for a variety of different purposes, right? So we're actually looking at uh, using AI and machine learning to help us interact with our intelligence consumers more efficiently. <laughs> uh, those are almost pure commercial solutions that we're using. That's very different than what we're doing on the mission side. You know, uh, insider threat sorts of things. A lot of people in industry are, are really uh, you know, looking at those problems and those are available as tools but I think the main thing is uh, we have uh, an easier on-ramp for the latest you know, commercial capabilities. And uh, in these cloud environments, we can 
uh, use them for a, a more diverse set of purposes, uh, and uh, frankly, we can try them out, and if uh, we're not happy with the result, we just stop paying for them. So that adaptation and that experimentation uh, gives a lot of value, and uh, there's a lot of really great experimentation that's going on across you know, business systems and mission systems and uh, interactions with uh, consumers and customers. Uh, it's kind of the, this innovation taking place across the whole spectrum, I think, and across the community. Doug, add to that too, because uh, DIA, you guys may not have been as, as forward-leaning and NSA has been, but I'm sure the AI and the ML is starting to pay big dividends today. Yeah, it is, and that's true across the entire intelligence community. And you know, to, to pick up on some of Greg's points on automation, that's where we've seen it a lot on the data side. Uh, when I first came into this community, I was a server administrator. And so a big part of my job was every morning I'd take the network logs and every evening I'd take the network logs. That's all automated now. Um, and another area uh, that I had gotten into when I first started in this community uh, was also on data analytics, right? So I was a database manager and, and analyzing a lot of that data. Well, I would say 80% of my time was in preparing that data to do the analysis, and then 20% of my time was rushing to do the analysis. I'd say that, that ratio is now flipped, where a lot of the automation, the machine learning capabilities, I would even classify AI in this realm of the data preparations, uh, have now really helped us focus our functions and our efforts on what we can exquisitely do in the IC, right? The, our unique functions versus a lot of that, those manual tasks that we had to do in the past. You also came in probably during a time when there's like a uh, client server and yeah, yeah. this is the heyday of... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and now, now here we are yeah. talking cloud, right? Um, w when you talk about automation, does that also, and, and I don't want to go down too far down the path, but what does that mean for the workforce as well? Yeah. Is, it, is it giving your analysts more time to do, as you said, the 80-20 flip? Right. It does, but it comes at its you know, risks as well. Uh, the risk of... Autopilot, right? So we, we're not at the point, I see, at least from my, my perspective, of where artificial intelligence is replacing critical thinking. Maybe down the road, <laughs> but right, right now today we're not there. And I would say that's the biggest risk for us in the IC, especially on our analytic components and the functions that they perform, is remember to preserve that critical thinking. And I can give you a, kind of a, a humorous example of this. So my, sure, my wife has a, a newer car, she has a 2019 car, and you know when I back it out of the driveway, I was driving this last weekend, and people are walking behind me or their car's coming, you know, it's, it's signaling with all kinds of buzzers telling me there's something back there. Um, that in a way is artificial intelligence, right? It, it's helping me uh, identify my surroundings in an automated way. Uh, I have an older car that doesn't have any of those. So uh, the other weekend when I got out, I just backed out of my driveway without looking at all, right? So, I mean, it comes with its consequences to where you kind of get on this autopilot mode and, and sometimes forget to think. <laughs> and it really comes back to a tradecraft uh, perspective, right? We have to remember to think. It's when we get into AI and machine learning, it's sharing our homework with other agencies that rely on that analysis and the data, showing how we got it, what assumptions we had going into it, what our dependencies are, um, making sure that we look at it objectively. So those things are even more important today, I would say, than they have been in the past with the rise of these capabilities. All right, you know I gotta ask the question. You didn't hit anyone, did you? I did not. All right, that's good. You had we, we had us well worried for a second as you just backed out without yeah. looking. Uh, uh, David, jump in here a little bit, and, and I know from uh, Equinix Government Solutions perspective, AI, machine learning, that again is the benefit of, of having this multi-cloud hybrid setup. Is that coming up as you talk to your government clients? It is, and I think when you're looking at the multi-cloud approach, it's it's not. Um, honestly, not acceptable. It just, it's not, there's just not one cloud provider. There's just hundreds of cloud providers. So whether you're the government or enterprise, um, you need access to the data and you need to be interconnected with your customers. And so on the agency's perspective, that's other agencies and, and, commercial, and government contractors and et cetera. And so I think that hybrid cloud piece, if you think of the, you know, I, I look at it like the network and the cloud is going to be like the iPhone where everything's going to be virtualized. Um, and if you think about the leaps and bounds that technologies uh, on the iPhone have made, uh, for, you know, having, you know, I need a uh, stopwatch. No, you have one on your iPhone. I need a light. No, I have one on my iPhone. And if you think about the innovation that's happened uh, in that, um, with that technology, and you, you apply the same thing with network, with software-defined networking, and cloud and cloud architectures, 
Um, this is a fast moving train. And again, I think it, 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 for us, it stems back into, you know, we're a platform where 2,000 of those providers interconnect uh, larger than anybody uh, in, 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 in our competitive arena by far, both geographically and from the number of, you know, customers we have interconnecting. And I think, you know, that is again, the underpinning and support of the platform at what Equinix that we, you know, we talk about that really I think is the connective tissue into, you know, hybrid clouds, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, et cetera. I want to jump over to, to one last area of, of, when we talk about AI, machine learning, and cloud, it becomes part of the data governance. And, and both Doug and Greg, you guys have talked about the access control pieces, you've talked about the multi-factor authentication, the need to know, but there's still kind of a, a, a one step up of data and governance. Maybe Greg, lead us off with, how's NSA approaching this, this data governance piece as, a, again, cloud, AI, machine learning, all, all starts to kind of play into it. Right, so most of these um, big data analytics, the AI, machine learning, they just don't work very well unless you've conditioned your data the right way up front. Okay, and if and then uh, other sorts of conditioning to really understand, okay, uh, how the data, uh, who has a need to know this data, and other issues that we get into. You know, the signals intelligence business is, I would contend, is one of the most regulated activities on the planet. Uh, you know, how long we're allowed to hold data according to the laws and policies uh, and procedures. Uh, uh, matters. Uh, how we need to handle different types of data may vary. So labeling the data so we understand everything uh, there is to know about it and who's allowed to have it, how we handle it, and um, so that it can be effectively utilized in an automated way with uh, while still staying within all the, uh, the laws, the policies, uh, the need to know constraints that we're trying to do. Uh, it's important to address all of that. So a lot of that has to do with, you know, having data standards and labeling standards that cover all of these issues. And it's not good enough for NSA to have a standard. Uh, these are actually intelligence community standards and the intelligence community and the Department of Defense are having conversations. And we're having conversations with our allies about this so that we, we can really interoperate the way we need to at scale and at speed. Uh, so lots of different dimensions and the chief data officers sort of across the intelligence community and uh, across the federal government and with our allies are all kind of tackling these problems and bringing the rest of us uh, along uh, to help solve problems. Doug, is this idea of conditioning data, you know, kind of, does it ever stop you or does it ever create any kind of obstacle that, that DIA says, okay, we're not ready to use an AI tool or we're not ready to move to the cloud because the data just is too dirty? Well, it, it certainly does in certain contexts. I wouldn't just say generally across the board that's true, um, but in different mission areas, uh, the data changes at a different rate, right? It needs to get validated at different points in time. To Greg's point, we can only retain it for certain periods in, in different scenarios. Within our uh, chief data officer community, they're as tight-knit as our CIO community as well. So just like we've collaborated to transition to the cloud, they're collaborating across our entire community to transition the data. A uh, large part of that uh, that we do within the agencies is the governance of how we <coughs> condition and store and manage that data. And we've made some very significant investments in DIA on what we call a data governance platform, right? So it's the, of the data that we own, what are the laws, the policies, the principles that govern our use of that data? What other data does that relate to? Uh, when was that last validated and so forth? So we've spent a lot of time just managing the data but then the tagging of it and the conditioning, a lot of that is manual. And so there's still much, uh, much of an investment from a human perspective as well. We've hit upon a ton of different topics, cloud, security, AI, machine learning, now a little bit on the data side. Let me, let me ask David to, to maybe take us home now in our conversation. Agencies are in this continuum of cloud, of, of IT modernization. What's the, maybe the big takeaway from your perspective from our conversation today? Yeah, I mean, I think there's just, um, looking at the applications and the workloads and, and really trying to digest what's the smartest thing to do and what's the best way to, you know, to achieve the goal that you're trying to do. I think, again, not implying that the government was in a rush to do you know, data center consolidation and or movement into the cloud, but I think what we're seeing is the agencies have a lot of very, very bright people, of two of which we have here with us today, um, that are really solving a lot of these problems. And you know, we stand a lot to learn from that, 
uh, an industry, and that's where that collabor collaboration becomes uh, extremely important. Um, but I think it's just to, you know continue collaboration and, and involvement of um, it, it is definitely going to be a hybrid cloud world we're going to live in, um, and it's just a, it, you know it, it's just watching folks like uh, to the left of me that are um, what they're doing and why and learning from it will be critically important I think for industry to to, to evolve. All right, we have about thirty seconds for for both of you total, so I'm going to ask you one big uh, thing people should look out for or take away. Keep it short, Doug. I'll keep it short. I started with it's been an evolution in our learning and thinking, and it'll continue to be that way in the future. All right, and Greg, you get the last word. Okay. So um, definitely agree it's going to be a hybrid environment, and uh, some of you will hear about uh, a hybrid compute initiative that NSA is launching on where we're trying to get the advantages of uh, a tighter industry partnership, but the performance of on-premise compute uh, more about that later. All right, all right, plenty to look into. And unfortunately, we are out of time today. So first, let me thank my guests. Doug Casa is the Deputy Chief Information Officer at the Defense Intelligence Agency. Greg Smithberger is the Director of Capabilities and Chief Information Officer at the National Security Agency. And David Pete is the Vice President and General Manager of Equinix Government Solutions. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you. You've been listening to the discussion, a secure multi-cloud approach in government, sponsored by Equinix Government Solutions on Federal News Network. I've been your host, Jason Miller. For more on this discussion, visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search Equinix.